political process in Ukraine. And we'll talk about educational initiatives to help Ukrainian children around the world. Let's take a look at this video. Розстріляне дитинство. Долі вчителів та учнів and the future that froze in the broken windows of destroyed classrooms. Dance on the ruins of the bomb Kharkiv school. Footage that flew around the world. My great-grandmother, grandfather, aunt, father, and my younger sister started in here. Valeria Kobzeva only once wore her bright red dress, purchased specifically for the prom. Now I think it's like a symbol of the fact that here we are standing in ruins, but we are protected by the armed forces. We can stand in beautiful dresses, we stand protected and unheard. And if our school is rebuilt, I think I'll bring my children here. Anna Timchenko gave birth to her first child under Russian bombs in occupied Bucha, just in own apartment. Neighbors took delivery. Uh, Elise was all blue, she was not breathing and uh, simply didn't make any sounds, nothing. And they began to worry, didn't think what to do, and they began to discuss it all among themselves. And uh, on the third day, when the woman after childbirth had recovered, they tried to leave for Kiev. There were moments when the muzzles of tanks and machine guns were directed at us, and we passed all those destroyed houses, and we passed simply the corpses of our civilians. Your husband badly wanted us to have Alice. From the moment we learned that we would have a girl. And now he tells me every day, you see how I choose the name, how it fits. Because we really have Alice in Wonderland. Ala Moskalets and her daughter Sofia miraculously escaped from Mariupol. The husband remained. The occupiers left no stone from the Lyceum where Sophie studied. The behavioral analysis center that her mother founded had the same fate, the best in Eastern Europe. I couldn't take out any equipment, any manuals, nothing but my hands, feet and head. The Moskalets family ended up in Brown the Czech Republic. Ella was helped to get a job here. Now she's a researcher at the Department of the Faculty of Psychology. Sofia managed to finish the Ukrainian school remotely and without any exams to enter one of the most prestigious Czech universities. All of my friends, my fellow students, are now temporarily relocated here 99% are determined that when the war ends, we will go back to our homeland. We will cure it. We'd now like to welcome to the stage the First Lady of Lithuania, Diana Nalzadeni. A child's schoolroom is perhaps the first opportunity for collaborative discovery of the world and of themselves. The war made this discovery impossible. The task of physical survival became for a long time more important than homework and overshadowed the drive for knowledge. The war divided families as scattered classmates, beloved teachers and mentors around the world. How can we bring back the joy of learning to every child? And how can we return to the lessons of humanity and civilization rather than cruelty and barbarism. First Lady. Dear Olana, distinguished participants of the conference, ladies and gentlemen, the world today is in a state of hybrid war. Its impact is different from that of all previous wars. It is a war 
in which the battles are physically fought in Ukraine, but the violence transcends the borders of all countries. It is a war of evil against humanity, against all of us, a war that provokes and multiplies crisis of social systems, exacerbates tensions in societies, and threatens the world with hunger and long-term negative effects on the environment in which we all live. It is a war that threatens to destroy the world as we know it. It is a war in which the human psyche is the main target and where the aggressor seeks total dehumanization. If moral norms cease to apply the human psyche, especially the ch child's psyche, becomes essentially defenseless in the face of deliberate and brutal use of modern technologies against it. Every child in the world becomes a target for aggression. Is it possible to save the childhood when a new kind of hybrid Molotov cocktail is on the way. This destructive power we're beginning to realize in a full scale only now as war continues. If we want to save the childhood, we need to understand the extent of the danger of the changes brought in by this war and the underlying shifts in the norms of international responsibility and interrelation. This is not just a war over the occupied territory. It is a war to destroy ethnic population in its own ethnic homeland. It is a war against national identity. It is a forcible expulsion abroad of the ethnic population of Ukraine with a direct threat to their health and lives. It is a forcible disruption and separation of families. It is a forcible mass deportation of local people and their children from Notabene, their own homeland. It is a war against their identity, ethnic consciousness, and culture of all the nationalities living in Ukraine. Forced change of citizenship is an arbitrary unilateral act of, of, of coercion committed by the aggressor against children and adults on the territory, not a bene, of a sovereign country. This is a new normal for instigator of the war, which it openly declares Violence is being imposed on the whole world as a new reality of international interrelation. It is a norm that has nothing novel and nothing normal about it. Nothing civilized, nothing legitimate. Since the beginning, the cruel and unjust war launched by Russia, two sets 
of Ukrainian children have been forced to leave not only their homes, but also their homeland. Scattered all over the Europe, they are experiencing even more tension and losing a vital sense of security. They are losing their childhood. The war against children is war against the future of Ukraine. Almost every day we hear about children dying in Ukraine. Every such death is an embarrassable and unspeakable tragedy in the hearts of millions and billions. The trends are worrying. Russian missile strikes are increasingly targeting not only military objects, but residential areas, universities, hospitals, schools. It is horrible when the majority of Ukrainian children are quietly becoming victims of the war. For every little one killed, have, for every little one injured and scared, there are hundreds of thousands who are constantly reliving the horrors of war, the pain of separation, the fear, the hatred. It is a lasting trauma, a profound psychosocial, social, and emotional damage Every Ukrainian child is Ukraine's greatest asset. And the future of the country, which is today being mercilessly crippled and destroyed in front of our eyes. It is simply our duty to defend the principles of humanism. It is the duty of every decent human being to fight for the welfare of Ukrainian children with the same perseverance and determination that Ukrainians fight for their freedom and the freedom of all of us. The European, Euro European Union's decision to grant the candidate status to Ukraine was a significant historic step of solidarity with Ukraine. What more do we need to do given that since the end of the Second World War, there have not been so many refugees in Europe with such a clear sense of the temporariness of their status. Most Ukrainians firmly believe that this war will end and with their country's victory and are looking forward to returning home. But no one can say when this happens. This fragile, Temporariness. This becomes a difficult and above all psychological emotional, emotional challenge for those Ukrainians who are willing and able to study, to work, and finally to learn more about the culture of the countries that have hosted them. Their integration is not and will not be easy due to the numerous uncertainties but the host country's assistance must be effective and already requires extremely fast and non-standard as well as complex solutions. From the first days of the war, Lithuania has realized that standard approaches to the integration of foreigners cannot be applied to Ukrainian people, especially to children. In the face of Russia, fiercely attacking the Ukrainian language, culture, and tradition, as well as criminally abducting the Ukrainian children, it is our duty to not only to provide humanitarian aid to the victims of war, but also to help Ukrainians preserve their identity. Having lost in the Soviet gulags and exile the most educated part of the nation, as much as one-fifth of its intelligentsia, 
Lithuania understands very clearly the threats to Ukraine and the logic and goals of the same aggressor, repeating the same historical actions. Therefore, if we want to help Ukrainians, the first task of the entire international community is to ensure quality education for children focused both on integration and on preserving the Ukrainian identity. We have been doing this in Lithuania since the first days of war. So let me share our experience. Ladies and gentlemen, compared to Ukraine with a population of 44 million, we are a small country with just under 3 million inhabitants. But since the outbreak of war, Lithuania has already hosted slightly more than 22,000 Ukrainian children. From the very beginning, these young Ukrainians were treated in the same way as their peers in Lithuania. All Ukrainian school children have the opportunity to study the Ukrainian language, literature, and history for five lessons per week. In addition, some children enrolled in Lithuanian educational institutions study remotely in Ukrainian schools. Teachers from Ukraine who have come to Lithuania are also helping Ukrainian children to integrate into the Lithuanian educational system with around 500 of them already working in Lithuanian schools. Lithuania also pays special attention to meeting the cultural needs of Ukrainians. All cultural services from libraries and museums to opera, ballet and drama theaters, concert halls and film festivals have been made free of charge to all Ukrainian citizens. As we prepare for the new school year within our limited resources, we are looking for the right balance between quality education services and the continuity of the education process on the one hand and the preservation of the Ukrainian identity on the other. We are working on several dimensions at once. Number one, children whose families have no plans to settle in Lithuania and who plan to return to Ukraine as soon as possible will be able to study remotely according to the Ukrainian curriculum from the start of the new school year. They will also be provided with educational assistance in Lithuania, as well as the Lithuanian language and non-formal education classes. In Lithuania, schools offering the Ukrainian curriculum in Ukrainian as the language of instruction may also soon appear. The second and smaller group will consist of children whose families have decided to link their future with Lithuania. In this case, the education process will take place in Lithuanian schools and the, in the Lithuanian language, but the children will also have the opportunity to learn their mother tongue and gain knowledge about Ukrainian history and culture. Ladies and gentlemen, the steps taken by Lithuania and many countries neighboring Ukraine in, in the first months of the war were timely and essential. But today, we must look further ahead. We consider the third dimension, the opening of the Ukrainian center in Taras Shevchenko Street in Vilnius as a significant, innovative breakthrough. The Ukrainian center in Vilnius is designed to coordinate bilateral and multilateral efforts in Lithuania on permanent basis to identify and meet the needs of not only children, but also the entire Ukrainians, Ukrainian community. This joint initiative with the First Lady Olena Zelenska has become an open space which, is, which in the primary phase of development is turning into a real home for Ukrainians. 
a safe, a permanent haven in a foreign country where a wide range of much needed cultural, social, and educational activities take place. Today, Ukrainian sense of community and the Ukrainian identity can flourish freely in the Ukrainian center. Information and counseling services, as well as psychosocial therapy, are regularly provided there. Concerts, exhibitions, and conferences can be hosted in the center, as well as important community events. Ukrainians have access to computer facilities and a modern library adopted for the people with special needs. The rapidly growing number of visitors to the Ukrainian center shows that such a space was much needed for Ukrainians. In the long term, the center has the potential to develop into reliable, concentrated, scientific data and research hub to address operational and strategic strategic issues with the support of the international academic community. Thinking about the prospects of the Ukrainian center, Vitotas Magnus University was chosen as one of the founding members, as it has a vast experience of cooperation with the Lithuanian diaspora abroad. It is useful to the center not only as a powerful intellectual and academic resource, but also as a deep treasure trove of experiences of people who have gone through all ch stages of emigration in different countries and successfully integrated themselves into various cultures. At the same time, the Ukrainian center is like an ever-growing microverse, which not only allows us to more quickly identify and respond to the needs of the Ukrainian community, but also to identify emerging issues at an early stage. We have to admit that today we are still learning to live in a world shadowed by the dark clouds of war. And we are looking for answers to questions we did not expect in the 21st century. That is why we believe that the timely detection and identification of problems as well as joint search for solutions are of utmost importance. Together with the Embassy of Ukraine and Vitotas Magnus University, we are already in the second phase of the development of the Ukrainian Center. Our aim is to make it a Ukrainian information and cultural center in Lithuania, to showcase the Ukrainian culture and art, to implement project activities of organizations representing Ukraine, and to run the Ukrainian and Lithuanian language training programs. We are also looking further ahead. We see the Ukrainian center as a branch of the Ukrainian Institute in Lithuania, which would pursue its educational and cultural activities, and at the same time, it would strengthen Ukraine's cultural diplomacy and support Ukraine on its path to full membership in the European Union. Our aim is to help the Ukrainian Institute to be admitted to the EU's National Institutes of Culture family and to eventually become an important actor in cultural diplomacy as a Goethe Institute or the Institut Francais. Ladies and gentlemen, I am confident that Lithuania's approach and experience can serve as a source of inspiration for policymakers in developing common standards of assistance and integration in EU countries. Ukraine's neighbors, having hosted the largest numbers of war refugees, have gained unique experience that can serve as a role model for other countries. At the same time, they have assumed a huge responsibility and commitment to Ukraine's future. To secure it, we need the solidarity and support of the European Union and the 
entire democratic world. During the first summit of first ladies and gentlemen in Ukraine, we explored the peculiarities of increasing prosperity in different countries, discussed accelerators of progress, and mobilized international efforts to tackle the pandemic at a global level. Today, the reality is that in this conference, we are forced to talk about the consequences of the destruction of the state of people, of the identity of the nation, of the future of the nation. As well as the whole world, we are forced to deal with damages of wide range destruction, matters of survival, but not with prosperity of human itself, human life itself. Eternal question, to be or not to be. In the 21st century, emerged as a question for all humanity in Europe, America, Asia, Australia, Africa, West and East, as Ukrainian question. Budemo my, či ne budemo? As human beings, we all, only together, we can answer it. Thank you very much to the First Lady of Lithuania. Much appreciated. We're now going to remind you uh, to try and donate, if you can, to a very worthy cause. Here is a video to remind you about it. Мама у мене запитувала. Я відповів, що не гарантую, що довезу. Наші лікарі – це справжнісінькі чарівники. Вони роблять диво, навіть коли ніхто не вірить. Витягають, рятують, не сплять. І не кидаються роботу, навіть коли бомблять. Вони рятують життя, коли нам здається, що все втрачено. Але виявляється, навіть і їм треба допомога. Нашим чарівникам треба диво мобіль, і тільки з ними вони зможуть робити свої дива. Швидко приїжджати, долати погані дороги і ями, які залишаються від великих бум. Щоб всередині диво мобіля була маленька міні-лікарня з усіма дивоштуками, які потрібні нашим чарівникам. Може, якби і в моїх чарівників був такий диво мобіль, Вони б встигли зробити диво для мене. So we, have, uh, we have two speakers joining the summit. They are uh, Jaime Saavedra, Director of Education and Global Practice at the World Bank Group, and Kim Majerus, who's the Vice President of U.S. Public Sector Education, State and Local Government at Amazon Web Services. So thank you uh, both for joining us. Mr. Saavedra, how has the Russian war with Ukraine impacted the delivery of education? What should be done to support the continued education of Ukrainian children and youth? And how can the World Bank help? Ah, we can't hear you. Oh, you're not on mute, are you? We'll try and fix that. I think we've got a problem on the... We'll just... We'll work that out, I think. Have we fixed that yet? Can you hear me now? Oh, there we are. We can hear you now. Thank you very much. If you could start again, thank you. Thank you very you. much. Thank you so much. I, I want to thank uh, First Lady Zelenska for this invitation to the World Bank. It is truly an honor to be here. I, I want first to express my admiration to the people of Ukraine for its immense bravery, courage, and resiliency. 
Education is the most powerful force for a peaceful and prosperous future. It is completely unacceptable to deny the right to education to millions of children, to rob children of their dreams, of their childhood, of their future. Before the pandemic, children and youth around the world were, were already experiencing a learning crisis. In fact, over half of children in low and middle income countries were already living a learning, learning poverty. They were unable to read and understand a simple text by age 10, by the end of primary education. Then the pandemic came, the biggest global shock to education of the century. And children faced an unprecedented uh, school closures, which led to immense learning losses. Most countries, including Ukraine, had to face this silent crisis. But Ukrainian children are facing an unthinkable, even deeper crisis, because in addition to the COVID-related shock, they have now to deal with another shock, the Russian invasion. This is a dreadful tragedy. This crisis must be addressed immediately. Every passing minute counts. Unless we act now, the world will have lasting and massive impacts on the future welfare and productivity of this generation. The war in Ukraine is displacing students and teachers, destroying schools and harming education delivery. Almost 700,000 students and over 25,000 educators have been displaced. Over 2,000 education institutions have been damaged by bombing and shelling, and more than 200 of these have been completely destroyed. This is an unimaginable attack to education. The government of Ukraine and the Ministry of Education have taken bold actions to provide learning continuity. It has, they have expanded access to online learning platforms, provided psychosocial support for students, and simplified the university admissions process. Also, thanks to the all-Ukrainian online school digital platform that was established during the pandemic, around 85% of schools were able to complete the 2021-2022 school year. The government has facilitated economic mobility for higher education students internally and across Europe. But despite these efforts, the impact of the war on learning is severe. As the war decreases both the amount of instruction time children receive and the quality of that instruction. To safeguard the future of Ukrainian students, the World Bank is supporting education in Ukraine through various initiatives. We're supporting the government to pay teachers' salaries. Second, we're dedicating $100 million to the provision of scholarships for students in higher education. Third, we're supporting an online tutoring program for displaced students in Ukraine. The program aims to recover learning losses and provide psychosocial support. But this is not enough. We estimate that the cost of recovery and reconstruction of the education sector in Ukraine amount to more than $9 billion. To address this crisis, we need different ways to deliver the education service. Damaged schools need to be reconstructed. Remote learning must complement in-person instruction to guarantee the continuity of learning. Recovery must include remedial programs to help children catch up. Many children will be far behind level expectations, grade level expectations. Psychosocial support is also imperative. Children have been isolated. They have experienced and were or witnessed violence, death, or illness. The World Bank is proud to stand with Ukraine. It is great to see others here do the same. But make no mistake, the education crisis is severe and ongoing. And we have a long way to go to ensure children get the education they need and deserve. Each minute counts. I call on world leaders to join us supporting the children of Ukraine. Their future depends on our support. And the future of our societies depends on our children. Thank you very much indeed. I'd now like to go to Kim Majerus, uh, Vice President of U.S. Public Sector Education, State and Local Government at Amazon Web Services. Thanks, Pierce. Life in Ukraine has been disrupted, and it's difficult for us to imagine because we're not directly impacted. I know that teaching and learning in normal circumstances is difficult, 
And now to deliver education during a war period is extremely hard for the teachers and quite frankly, no student or teacher should actually have to experience. As it is so much, so much more difficult for them to show up physically in schools, it's extremely important that we provide remote learning those options to keep them connected to their language, their culture, their peers is top of mind for many of us. With technology, we've been quickly scaling education to those students across the world as they are displaced and are challenged to continue their education. AWS has been sporting. Ukraine's Optima School, which is the largest K through 12 school serving hundreds of thousands of them displaced. That is how we are going to help support those students to continue their free education. We're working tirelessly with the Ukraine Ministry of Education and Science to migrate and secure those essential data sets for K through 12 and higher education programs. One of these programs, the All Ukraine School Online, will provide students in grades five through 11 with a variety of learning resources. In higher education, we are migrating data of the 22 Ukrainian universities. It's so extremely important as those kids and those students are looking to complete their education that they have a way to validate the efforts that they've put in. And these are especially crucial as they look to move to the workforce. We're also committed to ensure that we're helping upskill and reskill. With so many of the brave men of Ukraine staying there to support and, and truly defend their country, many of the learners and displaced are moms and women who really need ways to support their children. Even before the war broke out, AWS was committed to ensuring that we provide free training, cloud-based skills, to 29 million people by 2025. We want to reach people of diverse backgrounds and all levels of knowledge in more than 200 countries and territories. We recently made AWS Educate, our free online self-paced learning platform available in Ukraine. And we're very proud to support Poland as they also leverage AWS Academy for Cloud Foundation skills to be available for those Ukrainian refugees, even without enrolling in university in Poland. Access to free training is extremely important. Those are the skills that Ukrainian people will need as they continue to rebuild their country, but more importantly, build their future, which is truly the students. I want to personally thank the First Lady of Ukraine for allowing us to share just a couple of the stories that we are doing our best to help support as you rebuild. AWS does understand the importance and the value of continuing education, ensuring that Ukraine and Ukrainians across the globe are the continued options that they need in order to rebuild and be independent Ukraine. Thank you very much indeed, Kim. Thank you. Uh, and uh, to both of you, thank you very much indeed. Now, quite an exciting little moment now. We've had lots of incredibly important people. We've had prime ministers, we've had presidents, we've had potential prime ministers, we've had lots of people, and now I'm going to pretend to be a real queen. So just forgive me for a moment, because I have a letter here for you, First Lady. This is actually from Her Majesty the Queen, Silver of Sweden. And I'm going to read it as if I'm the queen. Uh, Dear First Lady Zelenska, thank you for your invitation to attend the second summit of First Ladies and Gentlemen. The focus of the summit, the role of human capital in rebuilding societies, is much needed in light of the devastating effects of war. It is important both for Ukraine and for all the other countries affected by conflict around the world. Please accept my best wishes for the well-being of the Ukrainian people at this difficult time. I regret that I'm unable to attend the summit, and it's my firm conviction that the engagement of international leaders to end the suffering and to rebuild societies is essential to making the world a better place. I'm convinced that Sweden and its people will continue to make great efforts to support Ukraine. Sylvia. We're now going to bring in uh, the people who are on stage with me. Welcome uh, to all of you. I'm going to introduce you. Um, I'll probably just start actually by going to our, uh, our first panel member here. 
who is uh, Mihailo Fedorov. He's a Minister of Digital Transformation. And uh, I'm just going to... Yes, Mr. Fedorov, you're described as the main transformer and innovator of the Ukrainian digital sphere. Does digitalization take into account the insane loss of people due to, due to military actions? And what can digital education do for Ukrainian children and adults in times of war? Can it provide real learning opportunities? Hello, everyone. I would like to first thank all the teachers and instructors in our country. Thanks to your efforts, our children continue to study and uh, receive education. Now, we talk about the future. You all, um, uh, we all, we've all seen and understand that it's impossible to break Ukrainians. The same can be said about our education system. What uh, is it comprised of? Infrastructure. Just last year, we uh, added over a thousand rural schools to the internet, more than 500 kindergartens in rural areas, which is where we have 95 percent of uh, coverage among our preschool and school facilities in rural areas are um, covered internet. And uh, thousand teachers uh, received um, laptops. Now another 40,000 we received from Google, which has been a great help. Education is also teacher skills to teach our children. Uh, the pandemic has uh, taught us uh, many new skills. Just two years ago, we started teaching the teachers to uh, have lessons online. So we've gone through the pandemic time quite successfully in education time. And now during the war, well, these skills keep helping us because there's internet um, in schools and teachers can have lessons there. Uh, the teachers are now skilled to use different IT solutions uh, for their instruction, and the kids themselves have been, been used, uh, have you used to, to learning online. So 13,000 uh, new um, Starlink connections in education and other areas. So whatever happens, we maintain the internet uh, connection active. So what next? We are very clearly understanding what uh, we need to continue teaching online if the need uh, is also maintained. On the United 24, there will, there will be new procurement lots for uh, as many laptops as we need. And everybody watching us, partners, companies, please join in. Um, the educational uh, vector in United24, there will be education-related lots soon. We also work on ICT as a subject, information and computer technologies. It's important to teach our children to use Internet for learning, that Internet is not just a tool for entertainment. It's not just for reading and consuming information uh, that has little to do with learning. So now we um, we are creating together with the Ministry of Education a new um, IT system and a platform that the kids will be motivated to start coding, to learn uh, digital marketing skills, so to use internet to build their future, not just to consume information, to gain new skills. So this new IT system um, and the platform for a new um, academic subject, the ICT, will help children navigate in their own skills what is um, more interesting or more exciting for them. So this is a new stage of developing ICT as an academic subject. So if I sum it up very shortly, we've um, used these several years to build a new foundation to be ready to, to for challenges. We've been through pandemic, and I'm confident we will be successful in this war as well. Uh, it's not only about sustainable education, but thinking about the future. The world is developing. Education as an industry is developing. And we have to be competitive. 
on that market. So that's why we introduce new um, academic subjects like entrepreneurship, programming skills, startups, and all of that in conjunction with the new academic subject ICT or uh, ICT rethought. So we'll Thank you very much indeed. I appreciate that. it. We're now going to go to Elke Budenbender, the spouse of Federal President Frank Walter Steinmeier, who's joining us. Uh, welcome to you, and please tell us about the children's help, in particular UNICEF initiatives. Thank you. Mrs. Olenska, Olena. Oh, am I on screen? Sorry, okay. Yes, we can see you and Mrs. we can hear you. Far away. Thanks a lot. Mrs. Olenska, Olena, esteemed first ladies and gentlemen, dear guests. The bombs fall, childhood ends. Ever since last February, children in Ukraine have had to fear their lives and those of their mothers, fathers, siblings, and grandparents. They have witnessed violence and seen bombs hit their neighbors' homes. They have to had seek refugee in underground stations or even flee. From their homes, the place where they used to feel safe, where they went to school, played sports, or had piano lessons. The place where they met friends, had fun, and loved. This carefree existence gave way to fear and concern from one day to the next. They are scared, and they sense the fear of those around them. This is a heavy burden that can make them ill. In regions with heavy fighting, everything is in short supply. Food, medicine, sanitary facilities, and drinking water. Around 3 million children in Ukraine depend on humanitarian assistance. Therefore, we need to take action. We need to contribute whatever we can to protect children in all points and those forced to flee from further trauma. To enable them, as far as possible, to experience normality. For a little over five years now, I have been patroness of UNICEF Germany. On my visits to UNICEF projects across the world, I have observed that children are, for the most part, astonishingly resilient. This is very impressive to see. Despite all their bad experiences, they are able to bounce back, to return, retain, sorry, their inner balance. Then they are given support and have safe havens, places where they can play and learn. Schools play a key role in this regard. Education is not only a key to giving children the tools for leading a good and self-determined life. Schools are, above all, a safe place, and that gives stability and some degree of normality. UNICEF also provides life-saving aid supplies. This includes medical equipment and medicine, blankets and warm clothing, as well as games and learning materials. Together with its partners, UNICEF has established so-called Spirino Children's Centers. Mobile teams support this important work, for instance, at assembly points for displaced families and border crossings. UNICEF also helping authorities in Ukraine's neighboring countries to enable access to child and youth services as well as education. Leader points of contact have been set up, safe havens where families receive assistance. So in the face of all this suffering, what gives me hope is a strong solidarity and willingness to help shown by so many people in places where Ukrainian children and their families have found a temporary home. Everyone pitches in to help with whatever they can provide, housing, food, clothing, and education, either at school or in early years at the kindergarten. In Germany, for instance, Ukrainian children have been quickly integrated in German schools and kindergartens. 
there were so-called welcome classes, but many children have already moved into the usual classes with their German classmates. They are also being taught in Ukrainian wherever possible. And some are attending digital lessons in Ukrainian on the basis of Ukrainian curricula. I'm very happy and impressed to see this level of dedication and support by so many. But we all hope, of course, that soon it will be not longer be necessary and that those who have fled will be able to return to their homes. After all, as far as I know, this is their own biggest wish. There are also other children around the world who are suffering because of Russia's war in Ukraine. Let's not forget about them. The war has greatly disrupted food production. This has contributed to a rise in food prices everywhere. Children are, again, the hardest hit. Malnutrition has already increased, for example, in the Horn of Africa, where climate change has already led to severe famine. Now, food to help starving children has become more scarce and therefore more expensive. It is therefore important that we support Ukraine as long as it is needed. Additional support from more donor countries is required for children worldwide, not a mere reallocation of funds if we are not to prevent more children from falling into misery. I would like to say on behalf of UNICEF, it's time to stand up for children. All of us have a responsibility to do all we can to make this happen. All of us includes us, with ladies and gentlemen. We can have a profound impact in the humanitarian sphere. I know that many of you are already doing a great deal in this area. Let's not slacken our efforts. Let's work for our children, our future, and especially in times such as these. Let's look to see how we can achieve still more together. I, for my part, I'm open to engaging in common initiatives. After all, we can only get on the top of the crisis, of the global crisis, if we act together, all of us. Thank you all for your contribution, for your important contribution to this. I look forward to continuing to work with you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Elke Budenbender. Uh, now, we're running a little bit l late on time here, so I've been reminded by the people that lurk in the darkness out the back there uh, that if we could try and restrict the speeches now to about two, three minutes maximum, or we're going to have to bring in the Oscars music, you know, that comes in. And then you get removed quietly. So uh, we can do this the easy way or the tricky way. I, I, I prefer the tricky way, actually. But anyway, um, if everyone who's going to speak can keep it uh, short and snappy, we'll get everybody in. Uh, thank you very much, Shadi. We've got a recorded message now from Catherine Russell, who is the UNICEF Executive Director on Consequences of the War for Ukrainian Children and Parents, UNICEF Projects to Support Families with Children. It's an honor to be invited to speak at this important summit held at this critical moment in such a significant place. I want to thank Ukraine's First Lady, Ms. Elena Zelenska, for hosting this summit in Kyiv and for focusing the world's attention on the needs of Ukraine's children as the war rages on. This war is a child rights crisis. Two out of three children have been displaced from their homes. They have witnessed things no child should see experience things no child should suffer. UNICEF is committed to working with the government of Ukraine and our partners to support children and families, both inside Ukraine and in neighboring countries where so many millions have fled. We especially welcome and support the government's commitment to helping every child realize their right to learn. Getting children back to learning is a critical step in restoring normalcy in their lives after months of war and years of COVID-19 disruptions. And education can be an entry point for delivering other critical services, including psychosocial support that can help children heal and rebuild their lives. With attacks on schools and mass displacement of students and teachers continuing, this is not an easy task. 
but it is an essential and an urgent one. We need to reach every child, assessing their learning gaps and ensuring they can catch up on lost learning. And children's safety and well-being must be our top priority. For some children, this may mean a traditional classroom. For many others, it may mean online learning at home or in neighborhood clusters. But providing every child with safe access to education and a sense of security is critical to their ability to learn. UNICEF will continue to do everything we can to support Ukraine's children, delivering life-saving supplies to children most affected by the fighting and providing critical services to children who have been displaced. We will continue to call for children to be protected from violence, for an end to attacks on their schools, and for safe and equal access to services. Above all, we will continue calling for an end to this brutal war. Until then and beyond, we stand in solidarity with the children of Ukraine. Much indeed, Catherine Russell. Well, we're going to London now. Uh, London has been roasting, if you haven't noticed. It was 41 degrees Celsius a few days ago. Hottest ever temperature in the history of the United Kingdom. So if you're wondering why I look bright red, that's why. Um, we're going to go to... Uh, Danilo Nikiforov is the founder of the Ukrainian Student Union and president of the Ukrainian Society of London School of Economics. Welcome to you, Danilo. We're going to test your ability to speak brilliantly, but only for two to three minutes. Do you think you can do that? Uh, yep, I'll do my best. And uh, good afternoon. My name is Danilo Nikiforov. And, uh, Obviously, I might not be as influential or famous as the esteemed expert and speakers before me, but the direction which, in which my colleagues and I work is particularly important for the future of Ukraine and the reconstruction efforts of Ukraine. The future of any country is its students and youth. But unfortunately, after a full-scale invasion of Ukraine, hundreds of thousands of students left our country. More than 2,000 of educational institutions, including uh, universities and schools, were destroyed. Uh, we can rebuild the buildings, we can rebuild the schools, however, how do we make sure that our future generation come back home? How do we make sure that the children of war of Ukraine come back home? Our role as students who have already studied abroad was to welcome, to empower and to make sure that the new incoming Ukrainian students feel safe to continue their education. Since the beginning of the invasion, our students showed real patriotism and unprecedented willingness to sacrifice themselves for the future of Ukraine and for our beloved country. Despite the fact that we are not under direct threat of Russian bombardments, strikes and shelling, uh, our loved ones and family are in constant danger, which puts immense amount of stress upon us, particularly with continuing our education and continuing with the day-to-day -day, uh, work. To show that we are not alone, and to support students abroad, with the help of my colleague, I decided to establish an organization that would support Ukrainians abroad in every possible way. The organization that I have the privilege to present to you is called the Ukrainian Students' Union, and it brings together Ukrainian students and young professionals in the UK, and soon in Europe, and soon in the whole world. Since the beginning of the invasion, we hosted fundraisers, organized protests and vigils across numerous UK universities, we even hosted a Britain-wide conversation with President Zelensky to address the concerns of our students. By joining our efforts with the consular section of uh, the Ukrainian embassy in London, we managed to uh, negotiate with universities and waive uh, a lot of tuition fees for uh, the member universities of our organization. Uh, thanks to the support of the British government and uh, the Prime Minister himself, we were able to provide feedback and advice how Ukrainian students could be supported, including with their visas and scholarships. And after our mission to Brussels, I'm, allow uh, I'm delighted to announce that we are working on creating an internship program for Ukrainian students in the EU institutions, after which our students will return to share their experience with Ukrainian institutions and bring their new ideas. Now that Ukraine is a candidate to join the EU, our goal is to grow and to raise the new generation of future leaders of Ukraine, which would bring the European way of life and European values to Ukraine. And uh, not to keep it long, so finally I would like to say uh, glory to the armed forces of Ukraine and Slava Ukraini. Well said, Danilo. And well done on the time as well.
We now, I think we have a recorded message now from some footballer. I, I forget his name. Hello, everybody, joining this important summit. First, I'd like to thank UNICEF and First Lady Elena Zelenska for inviting me to send a message of support for Ukraine. I've been a UNICEF Goodwill Ambassador for over 17 years, and in that time, I've met children from all over the world. Children who have survived terrible disasters and conflict. And when I meet them, I'm always moved by the amazing spirit and determination of children and their parents. I'm frustrated once again that children are going through terrible trauma and pain, seeing things that no child should have to see. As a father, I've seen how a break in a child's routine like the lockdowns we experienced during the COVID pandemic can affect children, their mood, their development, even their health. And since the war in Ukraine began, I've been following the situation and speaking with UNICEF staff on the ground. I cannot imagine what the Ukrainian people have gone through these past five months. But I do know through my experiences with UNICEF that getting back to routines through education and learning is a great healer for many children. Whilst the war isn't over, it's important that whatever possible, we give children a chance to recover, to play, to meet new friends, to be close to their families, and to start to regain their childhoods. School is about learning, but it is also about so much more than that. When I was growing up, I was lucky to have teachers and coaches who guided and encouraged me to achieve so much more. All children deserve that, and Ukrainian children must be protected and kept safe. That is our duty, all of us, as parents, leaders, mentors, and guides. And by recreating that feeling of safety, children will start to learn again and to dream of their futures. I wish you all the best for these important discussions today. Thank you. It's England football legend David Beckham, who's a UNICEF Goodwill ambassador. And on the football front, can I just say personally, as a big fan of Arsenal, I'm absolutely jubilant today because we've just signed a brilliant Ukrainian player called Zimchenko. And I, I'm personally thrilled. Any Arsenal fans in the room? Oh, there are. Oh, the first lady. Really? I didn't know that. Really? Oh, well, we're both, we're both celebrating then because apparently he's brilliant. Um, so that's good news. Uh, nothing to do with the summit, but I'm happy about it. Um, and the other thing about the timing is apparently the reason we've got to speed things up is because there's a curfew. And if you want to eat before the end of the curfew, I've got to stop this at some stage. So um, we're going to come back to the panel. I'm sorry about this, but you are going to be a bit restricted on time. I hope you don't mind and you won't think I'm being just rude about it. Um, I'm just being told by the people up there. Um, so I want to come now to uh, Daria uh, Gerasimchuk, who's the Commissioner of the President of Ukraine for Children's Rights. How should the state respond to these extraordinary challenges? particularly against Ukraine's children. Well, I hope I will uh, make it in four minutes. Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear uh, participants, when we hear the word learning or instruction, we have different pictures in our mind, school, classes, children. But this year in Ukraine, it's all but different. And, the, and a lot of Ukrainian schools will not expect schools come back. We not, will not expect children to come back to schools because of the bombardment, because of the shooting and shellings of uh, Ukrainian academia by Russians. Over 2,000 establishments were ruined or damaged, and over 5,000 or over. Uh, 1.5 thousand destroyed. Even if a child has survived, but still they have been wounded in their spirit or body, and they will never perceive learning again as peaceful as it was before, just as well as millions of, Russian, of, of Ukrainian children before the Russian war. 
because every child has been traumatized by it. I'm going to talk about Seraphim and Timothy from Kiev Oblast um, who lost their parents. Their parents were shot right in the car. And when now the older of the brothers is writing a diary um, describing how the story of his childhood was, because a lot of children who grew up with him are no longer there. And he believes that childhood is always some kind of story. So he continues to write it. After our victory, in order to rebuild Ukraine, we have to remember that every day we have to account the needs of those children who have been physically traumatized and or psychologically traumatized. We should build a barrier-less, friendly environment for every child where they um, have free mobility, where they have psychological support, where they can receive inclusive or special education if the need be. So millions of Ukrainian families have moved either within Ukraine or abroad to rescue their children. Just as well, about 2 million Ukrainian children uh, gone, have gone abroad. Those children are not refugees. They are looking for temporary shelter um, to, to stay safe from Russian bombs and shells. And they need constant support to keep their identity, to continue being immersed in Ukrainian language, culture, and history, and have full access to Ukrainian online schooling. But still, all those children want to go home. Unfortunately, not all of them will have that opportunity right now. Why? Because let me tell you one more story. Here's Irina and Vitaly Tsulukhin, uh, who were custodians to 10 children of parentless children. And they also had their natural daughter. When Rubizhna was under shelling, the wife uh, moved to a safer region, but the husband stayed there to keep the most valuable thing, their house. On the 30th of the month, uh, they got news that the Russians have bombed that house and their father has died. So what do we do next in order to retain those host families, these orphanages of family type that we have already, and to create more new of them so that every Ukrainian child would grow in a family, not just an institution. We need many of such houses. You all are clearly understanding that war is a huge stress for everyone. But for a child with special needs, with disabilities, it's stress multiplied by 10,000. So when we talk about rebuilding walls and shelters, and we should not forget the rebuilding of the system of services, social, medical, educational, so that each Ukrainian child is eligible to safe education, safe life, close to conscientious adults. Of course, with all the brutality of the war waged against Ukraine, has no limit. Now the aggressor country is saying something like there's 350,000 stolen. Those are kidnapped children, that they are not going to return to Ukraine. We know um, 5,600 children that were deported or illegally moved to Russian Federation. And our next mission, if we talk about challenges today, is to find and return each Ukrainian child that was kidnapped by terrorist state of Russia. So the world community should join efforts to jointly rescue our Thank children you very much. in the future. We're now going to go to a recorded message from Emine Erdogan, the First Lady of the Republic of Turkey. Ukrayna Devlet Başkanı'nın kıymetli eşi, değerli dostum, Olena Zelenska hanımefendi, Devlet ve Hükümet Başkanlarının saygıdeğer eşleri, muhterem hanımefendiler ve beyefendiler, sizleri en kalbi duygularla selamlıyor, Türk halkının saygı ve sevgilerini gönderiyorum. Barışa ve beşeriyetin huzuruna büyük bir katkı olduğuna inandığım bu zirveye davetlerinden dolayı Sayın Olena'ya bilhassa şükranlarımı sunuyorum. Bildiğiniz gibi Ukrayna'daki savaş 
5. ayını dolduruyor. Aradan geçen sürede maalesef on binlerce insan hayatını kaybetti. Milyonlar evlerinden, yurtlarından oldu. Bu savaşın yerinden ettiği insanların 5 milyonu çocuklardan oluşuyor. Kıymetli dostum Olena'nın gönderdiği bir mektup üzerine bir girişim başlattım. Ukraynalı yetim çocuklar ve refakatçilerinden oluşan savaş mağduru yaklaşık 1300 kişiyi ülkemizde misafir ediyoruz. Çocuklarımıza yaşadıkları travmanın etkilerini azaltmak için psikolojik destek sağlıyor, kültürel faaliyetler düzenliyoruz. Yunus Emre Enstitümüz ile ülkemizdeki yaklaşık 1200 Ukraynalı yetim çocuk için Türkçe kursları başlattık. Ukraynalı okutmanları yüz yüze ve çevrim içi kurslara entegre ederek ders vermelerini sağlıyor ve bu zor süreçte onlara da destek oluyoruz. Enstitümüz çocuklar için temel Türkçe kitabı hazırladı. Ukraynalı Türkologlar bu yayınlarda yazar, çevirmen ve editör gibi roller aldılar. Bu kitap ayrıca çocuklar için hazırlanan Dünyadaki ilk Türkçe Ukraynaca öğretim kitabıdır. Bunun yanında ünlü Ukraynalı yazar Nesya Ukrayinka'nın Zorluklar Öğretir adlı masalının basımını tamamladık ve Ukrayna'nın Ankara Büyükelçiliğine teslim ettik. Milli bayramlarımızın kutlamalarında Ukraynalı çocuklarımızı misafir ettik. Önümüzdeki günlerde onlar için 3 günlük bilim, kültür, sanat temalı bir etkinlik düzenleyeceğiz. Bir yandan da Ukrayna'ya ve komşu ülkelere sığınan Ukraynalı kardeşlerimize insani yardım göndermeyi sürdürüyoruz. Bugüne kadar 100 tır dolusu yardımı Ukrayna'ya ve Moldova'ya ulaştırdık. Değerli katılımcılar, 2021 yılında 89.3 milyon olan mülteci sayısı Ukrayna savaşıyla maalesef 100 milyonu aştı. Savaş herkesi etkilerken maalesef ki kadınları ve çocukları orantısız olarak etkiliyor. Barınma, güvenlik, gıda, sağlık ve eğitim gibi temel ihtiyaçlardan mahrum oluyorlar. Hayatları onarılması güç yaralar alıyor. Şu gerçeği çok iyi anlamalıyız ki dünyanın bir yerinde savaş varsa insanlık oradan kan kaybetmekte ve feci bir sona sürüklenmektedir. Çünkü savaşlar hiçbir zaman sürdürüldüğü sınırlar içinde kalmaz. Hali hazırda Ukrayna'daki savaş da tüm dünyanın ekonomik ve siyasi bir bunalım içine sürüklenmesine neden oluyor. Dünya barışı dediğimiz ideali gerçekleştirmek için uluslararası toplum olarak tüm zulümlere eşit reflekslerle karşı koymamız lazım. Çünkü dünyanın tüm çocukları insanlığın öz evladı, tüm insanlar insanlık ailesinin eşit mensuplarıdır. O yüzden Herkesi Ukrayna'nın yeniden imarında rol almaya davet ediyorum. Irk, dil, din gibi ayrımları gözetmeden savaş mağduru tüm kadın ve çocukların desteklenmesi için el ele verelim. Türkiye olarak diplomasinin tüm araçlarını en üst düzeyde kullanıyor ve bu savaşın durdurulması için çalışıyoruz. Savaşın yıktıklarını ayağa kaldırmanın ve tüm dünya olarak el ele vermenin yeni savaşların önündeki en kuvvetli kalkan olacağına inanıyorum. Lider eşleri zirvesinin Ukrayna'daki trajediye bir kere daha dikkat çekmesini ve bu kötü günlerin bir an önce geride kalmasını yürekten diliyorum. Sizlere saygı, sevgi ve en iyi dileklerimi gönderiyorum. Kalın sağlıcakla. Thank you very much to the First Lady of the Republic of Turkey.
Well, our next speaker became the first Ukrainian and the second woman in history to win the Fields Prize in Mathematics. It's often called the Nobel Prize for Mathematicians. So, delighted to be joined now by Marina Vyazovska, who is now almost as big as Hollywood stars, uh, such as the growing fame, and clearly has a gigantic brain. So, I might be out of my depth here, but I'm going to try. Uh, Marina, if you could just explain to me, perhaps very specifically and briefly, if you don't mind, uh, how Ukrainian students and school children abroad can take advantage of new educational opportunities. Greetings to all of the guests of the summit, uh, first ladies and gentlemen. I thank you, the first lady, for organizing this event. I want to tell you that I went to school on uh, September 1st, 1991, first grade, two weeks after our independent Ukraine was born. And I thank Ukrainian school and, universal, and university for my education. Now we see, unfortunately, like Ukrainian universities and schools are being destroyed in this completely illicit and unjust war of Russia against Ukraine. Millions of Ukrainian children have been forced to become refugees. Among them are my nieces, are my nephews. Children who were forced to leave their country there are now, they have to adapt to the new system of education. And one of the first stages of that adaptation process is, of course, learning a new language. From my own experience, I can tell you that it's very challenging. It was for me, and it is for anyone who has ever learned a second language. It's, a hard, it's hard work, but you get rewarded handsomely because new languages are like keys to new lands and new people. At the same time, children who are now uh, staying safe in another country, it's important for them to retain connection with Ukrainian culture, language, and school, because they're dreaming to, at some point, come back to Ukraine. So it's all very important, therefore, to have online learning projects that the speakers before me have mentioned, and establishing Ukrainian culture centers that we've also talked about today, like um, the center that's been created in Lithuania. I have a scientific background, and I can tell you that science never exists without freedom. The leading academia and scientific establishments all over the world have condemned the Russian war against Ukraine and have offered assistance to Ukrainian students, scientists, and teachers. And there are numerous support programs available for the scientists. It is the international network Scholars at Risk that is aimed at helping the scientific community. Most of the universities have opened their doors to Ukrainian students, have created uh, special curricula, like, for instance, Lasagna uh, Polytechnical University, where I work. This year has hosted about 40 students from Ukraine and 12 scientists and instructors who had to leave Ukraine. But there's one thing I want to mention more. It's a difficult situation for the scientists who remain to work in Ukraine, because there's a very little number of programs that are available for them as a help. I am confident that Ukraine will be victorious in this war. And I'm confident that in the future, Ukraine will have a very powerful system of education and science. And that Ukrainian scientific community is ready to 
create new projects, but uh, how to, uh, about the future. And I want to thank everybody who's helping Ukraine, who's thinking about new ways of helping, because this war is large scale and the scale of assistance is very impressive. But at the same time, the scale of a problem is, is very huge. And for many of these problems, there are still no recipes or remedies. But I want to thank the most our brave defenders, the men and women uh, serving in the military. Without them, there is no future, of course. Thank you very much indeed to Marina. I'm now going to have a short recorded message from Ewan McGregor, the actor and UNICEF ambassador. Hello, it's Ewan McGregor here. I'm sorry I can't be with you today. And thank you to our host, Olena Zelenska, for inviting me to address this important summit. It's hard to believe that it's 150 days since war broke out in Ukraine. 150 days of families torn apart and children's lives turned upside down. In my 18 years as a UNICEF ambassador, I've visited many countries and seen the devastating effects of war on children. In 2016, I witnessed firsthand the impact of war on Syrian refugee children. I've met many children who have seen violence that they should never see. In Ukraine, schools have also come under attack, with over 2,000 buildings damaged or destroyed. Schools must be a safe sanctuary for children, and UNICEF knows that schools help children recover from the scars of war and should be a safe space where they can learn and play. UNICEF is doing vital work for children and families across Ukraine, from 60 emergency rapid response teams to play centers for children in over 115 locations. We know that UNICEF will continue to reach children and families, but we need more support. I wish you good discussions and strong actions coming out of the summit. The children of Ukraine need the chance to be children again. They need peace, so they can return to learning and to play. Thank you so much. Thank you to Ewan McGregor. I want to come now to our third panelist, uh, Fede Shandor, who's a university professor, has actually been giving lectures on tourism studies right from the trenches, an extraordinary uh, situation. Um, tell me about that. Tell him about the challenges of doing your work you know, during a war. Thank you, uh, thank you, First Lady. It's a great honor for me to be invited here. I represent two institutions, the uh, first institution of the war, and which is Army, and institution of education. Because I've been teaching for 27 years, I'm a PhD in philosophy. Uh, I celebrate 150 days that I'm in the red zone next to Slavyansk. So it's just, uh, my, I had my lessons, my students were listening, and only after the first explosions of uh, MSLR Pion, I had to tell the students what's happening. And those who remained after the lecture, I showed them where I am. So that was the black swan of Taleb, that made me a little more popular than I was. So that's why I'm here. Tomorrow, I'm, I, my duties, I, I will be sending uh, greetings from Slovyansk again. Basically, answering your question, I have my duty in peaceful time to teach it's my main line of duty. In the wartime, my line of duty is protecting my family and my nation. Otherwise, the enemy will never stop, neither in Kherson or Donetsk or Crimea or Kiev or in my native Transcarpathian uh, Ukraine. It only will stop if, if they are stopped or they conquer the world. And they also are uneducated. If you remember uh, Tolkien books, orcs and goblins, only an educated slob 
can dig their trenches in Chernobyl forest. Only an uneducated creature can tie the hands of a girl and rape them. Only uneducated wild creature can just kill randomly people in a Kiev region and make a, a nuclear power station, turn it into an ammo depot. Yesterday, we lived through COVID. Then uh, now it's monkeypox, there was war going on. The two in uh, India and China, uh, new wave of COVID, 22 or 23, regardless of the name. Maybe the whole world will go online again. And as minister says, we need to create, together with Ukrainian diplomats and cabinet ministers, we need to create new solutions. The words of First Ladies, I remember the two interventions from the First Lady from Lithuania, who said that 500 teachers are in Lithuania now from Ukraine. And Ukrainian First Lady said that the first of the three challenges is getting back home. Of course, the world uh, gives us weapons, but we have to fight. Uh, the, the money will come, but we will have to teach. If we don't come back to Ukraine, there won't be a, a nation. So the, the task is to get those people back. You know, uh, the progress of dreamers is now behind the progress of conformity. The young people uh, would rather have an iPhone than to, to create something new. They, they are content with something that they're convenient with. If the student is enrolled in the Krakow University or Harvard University or Cambridge or Oxford, regardless of the name, doesn't matter where you study, in Harvard or Ushgorod, the social borders have changed. Yeah, I'm, I'm seeing you here, not on TV, but uh, right here. And we have first ladies of the world speaking to us. We hear them, we understand them, we hear them. But among the progressive people, we never, we, we don't hear uh, alumni of Cambridge and Harvard. Among the best artists or best architects, food bloggers, scientists, because we, we earlier we could say uh, a prominent architect from Guatemala, Arabic uh, countries give us more better architects now. Uh, photographers from Laos and Vietnam are prominent photographers. There's no Cambridge over there because Cambridge is too complacent in their comfort. So my concern is, is not that to, to have no job tomorrow. I'm in the military. There's a lot of work for us. Uh, we are already victorious, thanks to the civilized world. I don't doubt that, although science says never predict the future. But as Karl Korpert says, the old theories are obsolete, but the new theories are not yet in taste. Nassim Taleb says that those who who were your friends are will not be your friends. And those who were your enemy will, may not be your enemy. So online education poses a serious challenge. How not to lose 1.5 million of preschool students and 1.5 million school students? I'm not going to talk about higher education students. Maybe they they are less likely to return home. They are less uh, open to going to serve in the army. They, they, are, they will be reluctant to return back home only when it's peaceful completely. But the children and their parents and their teachers, this is where the task lies, to get them back home. In a month, there will be first meetings in schools of teachers and parents. And I know that schoolmasters and mistresses will not allow those teachers to teach who are not directly in Ukraine. And there's a big challenge for that, because there are many of these teachers who moved away, and there are not uh, the worst teachers. They were forced to move abroad. Maybe they will be allowed to teach online in schools. Maybe create some animations on YouTube, TikTok, what the society needs right now, some new stuff. And they will see that through the TikTok 20-second videos or cartoons, like the Kharkiv teacher uh, did 
some time ago. So it's a quick solution because we only have one month till uh, September 1st. All the parents know that September 1st, the bell rings. Although it's more of a Pavlov's re dog's reflex for us, but we have to restore the instruction as a process for preschool students and to get our teachers back home. From our side, we will continue uh, teaching and nurturing. I don't think I've, I've ever interviewed anybody who sits on a panel one minute and literally is going back to trenches to fight for his country. It's an amazing thing. So thank you. It's amazing. You, you sum up the Ukrainian spirit which is an extraordinary thing. So thank you. I appreciate it. Um, I've completely lost my way now. <laughs> no, no, I'm OK. I'm OK. Um, we've got the great honor now to speak to uh, Her Excellency uh, Rosanna Briseno, the spouse of the Prime Minister of Belize, Special Envoy for the Development of Families and Children. Your Excellency, thank you so much for joining us. What would you like to say to the summit? Hello. I want to, first of all, I want to thank the First Lady of Ukraine, Ms. Olena Zelenska, for this opportunity to participate in such a hopeful and inspiring but impactful event. Belize is a very small country nestled between Central America and the Caribbean. But Belize feels your pain and is now feeling the impacts of the war, especially in terms of food security, among other things. As an educator, my heart goes out to the teachers and children in Ukraine, especially our children with special needs. Our children have been affected terribly by the pandemic COVID-19 has kept back our children's education for over two years and now a war. Teachers will have and have a huge task of educating the children in Ukraine. Education is the key to success and to rebuilding what our children know as home and everyday life. The education process has to continue. I am confident that the teachers will be supported by our government and the world. We are all prepared to share best practices. Belize is a small country with limited resources. And there is no Cambridge here. But education is priority and with technology, Everything and anything is possible. The mere fact that I can share a message from Belize to your part of the world speaks volumes as a testament of what is possible technology, 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 <laughs> through technology sorry, and digitally. Belize fully supports Ukraine and totally condemns this war. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Your Excellency. Much appreciated. Now we have a recorded message from uh, Elisabetta Georgievska, who's the spouse of the President of the Republic of North Macedonia. Dear Madam Zelenska, dear friends, thank you for the opportunity to address this summit to reflect on how we could rebuild the future together from the devastating Russian aggression on Ukraine. Education is a fundamental right for every child. It is investment in the country's future, raises people out of poverty, levels inequalities and ensures sustainable development. However, whenever there is war and conflict, children always suffer the most. The war inflicted on Ukraine has left about two-thirds 
of Ukrainian children displaced, scared, in shock, and desperate for safety. Many of them suffering from social disruption and mental health issues. These traumas on families and children will have lasting consequences for generations to come. Restoring education for children is important to helping them heal and feel safe. Children that remain in Ukraine and children that have fled in other countries must be provided with continuous learning, as well as mental health and psychosocial support. Enabling children to learn in schools is not just a legal obligation, it is a moral duty and a fundamental right. We should pool and share resources to help rebuild Ukrainian educational system and provide support to educational initiatives that keep children schooled. Having welcomed children fleeing Ukraine, we, in North Macedonia, are providing them learning opportunities. Successful integration in schools can help children overcome their traumatic experiences and feel dignified, respected and accepted. We should continue with supporting Ukrainian children to be enrolled in schools. I'm well aware that education is only one segment of children's safety. Therefore, we must not forget the children's need for healthcare, social services, including kindergarten, and the adults' need for access to employment opportunities, health and social services. In these dire times, we must not forget of those duties and we should all work together to address these challenges with shared efforts. Thank you. Well, I want to tell you a little story now, an extraordinary story, a heartbreaking one, actually, a tragedy, salvation, but ultimately hope, like so many tragic stories in Ukraine at the moment. A six-year-old boy from Mariupol who lost both of his parents, but two wonderful people from Kyiv adopted him, and they're all here tonight. So, Ilya, where are you? Is he here? I hope he's here. Is Ilya here with his foster parents, Maria? and Vladimir. There he is. I can see him. Hey, Ilya. There he is. Come up, come up, come up. How you doing? Good? Good to see you both. How you doing? You good? You speak English? English? Well, yes, <laughs> I guess. Oh, Ilya, Ilya, I have a surprise for you, don't worry. And you'll be able to understand it, it won't be me saying it. Um, now, I heard you, you like football, yeah? You like football? You like football? Yeah? And I'm, do you speak English? Okay. <laughs> Here's what we're going to do, Ilya. We're going to first of all see your story on a little video to explain the story to everybody here. And then, yeah, that's good. OK, so let me say again. Ilya, we're going we're gonna to show a little film about your story, OK? So watch the film. Let's watch this film. You got it? <laughs> Yeah. He was raised by his mother there. His mother went out to buy food, so she went uh, to buy something. The mother never returned. The child spent three weeks in the basement. I want to be a striker who will strike goals, score goals, and uh, I'll be victorious. And every training, he's just looking forward for the training, and he's asking when he would go for a training. And which team uh, do you 
dream to play. I wish to play and I dream to play for the team of Mariupol because I was born there. Okay. So, Ilya, you can now understand me, right? <laughs> and you like football. And you want to play for Mariupol one day, and maybe you want to play for Ukraine. Yeah? So, Ukraine's greatest ever football player was Andrei Shevchenko. He was the best. And he was a striker, which is what you want to be. So we had a little chat with Andre, and he has a little surprise for you. So watch, watch the screen again, okay? And greetings, uh, and uh, thanks to the First Lady Olena Zelenska for the invitation and for the ability to join to this prominent event. I can see the family of Ilya Kostoshevich. I know your story, and I feel, and I would like to uh, express w uh, the words of uh, condolence. I remember your dream. I was running out of home and uh, playing ball with my friends. I was happy. I, have, I didn't think about anything else. But we had peas, and the football fields were not covered with craters. But still, it doesn't mean that we should uh, well, forget about dreams. I know everything will be perfect, and I know that I will be able to pass this ball that I will sign to you. We will have a meeting. We will play football at the same playground where I was playing as a child 40 years ago. So every one of us dreams, have a dream, um, and have a dream about the joint victory over the enemy, have a dream about the country that we will rebuild. And as the ambassador of United24, the platform that was founded by the president of Ukraine, Volodymyr Zelensky, I am confident. Thank you. Well, thank you very much to the great Andrei Shevchenko. Ilya, he's the best player Ukraine has ever had. I wish he'd played for Arsenal, my team. But maybe you will be, when you get bigger, the next Andrei Shevchenko. Maybe you're going to be Ukraine's next great striker. Would you like that? <laughs> That's a yes, huh? And thank you to your parent. What an amazing thing that you did to take this boy in and give him a new life and give him new hope. And there'll be so many people doing what you do and it's an amazing sacrifice that you do. So thank you very much on behalf of everybody here and everybody watching. <laughs> Ilya, thank you very much. Come and shake my hand. You're good, don't worry. Give me that, give me that. I'll take that, no problem. Take care, okay? Great to see you, Ilya. Um, that was great, wasn't it? That's what makes it all worthwhile. I may get him to sign a little contract for Arsenal, just in case he's got the Shevchenko magic. It looks to me like he might have it. Um, now, we have a message now, I think. Um, <laughs> I actually I have no idea who this... Next one is. Can you remind me? I lost my thread. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I've got it. Had a different name down. So this is a message from Her Royal Highness, the hereditary princess, uh, Sophie von und zu Liechtenstein. Uh, here's a message from her. Dear First Lady, Mrs. Zelenska, dear First Ladies and Gentlemen, I would like to thank you for organizing this summit and I feel truly honored to have the opportunity to speak to you today. One year ago, nobody amongst us 
would have imagined that Europe would experience such a horrible war. Nothing can justify the unprovoked aggression against Ukraine, including the large number of atrocities that are being committed during this conflict. From the very beginning, Liechtenstein has condemned the war as a blatant violation of international law. We have fully and quickly implemented all European sanctions against Russia and Belarus. Together, we must defend our common values, which include the respect for international law, human rights and democracy. Since February, I have been overwhelmed by the extremely strong solidarity of the Liechtenstein people with Ukraine. With 46 Swiss francs per capita, we are one of the highest per capita humanitarian contributors amongst all donors. Also, we have granted temporary protection to more than 260 refugees from Ukraine in Liechtenstein, including 60 children who are attending our schools. I have also been overwhelmed and deeply touched by the solidarity of the civil society and the private sector. Hundreds of people and private companies have collected money or relief items. Others have open-heartedly offered accommodation for displaced Ukrainian families. Liechtenstein has committed to contribute towards the recovery of Ukraine in accordance with its capacities. The recovery process should be guided by the rule of law, human rights and democratic principles. We are convinced that the perpetrators of international and human rights law must be held accountable for the committed crimes. The consequences of the war are of a global scale. We are all aware of the increasing food insecurity and the rising prices for energy supply. All of this affects us not only in Europe, but also in countries in Africa and the Middle East. We must therefore uphold and strengthen our solidarity with Ukraine without forgetting about the most vulnerable people in other parts of the world. Finally, let me once again reassure you of Liechtenstein's continued solidarity with Ukraine. I thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Your Royal Highness. And now we go to the First Lady of Ecuador, Maria de Lourdes Alcavar de Lasso, who has a recorded message also for us. Señores y señores, la invasión militar de Rusia ha puesto en riesgo la vida de más de 40 millones de personas en Ucrania. Los más vulnerables y desprotegidos son los niños, los adolescentes, los ancianos, los enfermos y las mujeres. Ecuador condenó el pasado 24 de febrero la decisión de Rusia de lanzar una operación militar que viola la soberanía e integridad territorial de Ucrania. Exigimos en este momento, y lo hacemos ahora, que se respeten la vida la seguridad y la integridad de todos los civiles. Los bombardeos, los disparos, la violencia, la destrucción de la infraestructura y de las viviendas son deplorablemente parte de la cotidianidad. Al menos 6.8 millones de ciudadanos han cruzado las fronteras de Ucrania hacia países de Europa Occidental, según las cifras de Agencia de Naciones Unidas para los Refugiados, ACNUR. De ellos, Más de 730 lograron salir con destino a nuestro país, en vuelos humanitarios gestionados por nuestro gobierno. La mayoría fueron con nacionales, pero también fueron rescatados ciudadanos ucranianos, peruanos, colombianos y de otras nacionalidades. No podemos ser indiferentes. Es necesario levantar nuestras voces para que se respete el derecho que tenemos todos los seres humanos a vivir en paz, a desenvolvernos en un ambiente sano y seguro que nos permita desarrollarnos a plenitud. Solo la paz y el diálogo serán capaces de solucionar las diferencias de manera constructiva 
y respetuosa para todos. Levantamos nuestras oraciones para que Ucrania vuelva a vivir en paz y que Dios nos bendiga a todos. And we now have a recorded message from Brigitte Macron, the First Lady of France. Mesdames, Messieurs, chers amis, je souhaitais commencer mon intervention par la lecture d'un message que j'ai reçu il y a quelques jours seulement, celui de Mikola. Mikola est un adolescent ukrainien de 14 ans qui est actuellement hospitalisé en France à Lille, où je l'ai rencontré en mars dernier. Voilà ce qu'il dit. Madame Macron, j'ai fini la chimiothérapie. J'ai supporté difficilement. Mais maintenant, je me sens bien. Les résultats du traitement sont très bons. Pendant le traitement, nous avons été très bien accueillis et aidés. Ma sœur a terminé l'école, elle a beaucoup d'amis. Les gens que j'ai rencontrés à l'hôpital, à la maison, ont un grand cœur. J'ai réalisé que la France est un pays sympathique. Nicolas n'est pas le seul. Comme lui, Anastasia, Darina, Diana, Kirill, Paulina, Valeria et de nombreux autres enfants et adolescents entre 2 et 19 ans sont en France pour poursuivre leur traitement contre le cancer. Leur accueil a été rendu possible grâce à une immense chaîne de solidarité qui a commencé en Ukraine et qui a continué en Pologne. Ces jeunes enfants sont arrivés en France et ont été pris en charge dans nos hôpitaux grâce à l'implication de nos diplomates, du personnel soignant, des bénévoles associatifs. Je remercie tous ceux qui ont participé à cette chaîne de l'espoir baptisée Cigogne et qui a permis de ne pas interrompre les traitements en cours. Cette solidarité se manifeste également en France avec l'accueil de plus de 20 000 élèves ukrainiens qui sont aujourd'hui scolarisés partout sur notre territoire. Afin qu'ils ne soient pas isolés, des classes virtuelles avec un enseignement en ukrainien ont été mises en place et se développeront lors de la rentrée de septembre. C'est un dispositif d'ampleur qui est essentiel pour que les élèves ukrainiens gardent un lien avec leur pays. Ils s'adaptent particulièrement bien et se sont vite fait de nombreux amis. Tous ces enfants souhaitent aujourd'hui retrouver leur famille, retrouver l'Ukraine. Il nous faudra les accompagner. La pandémie liée au Covid-19 a montré que la santé mentale des plus jeunes se dégradait. Celle des enfants réfugiés le sera tout autant. Il faut anticiper cette situation de fragilité aider le plus en amont ses enfants et ses adolescents. Nous sommes en train de nous coordonner avec des conjoints qui participaient au dernier sommet de l'OTAN à Madrid. Il s'agit d'envoyer cinq psychiatres par pays en Ukraine avec des médicaments et de mettre en place ensuite des plateformes de suivi. Vous pouvez compter sur mon entière mobilisation, chère Olena, pour continuer à aider et soutenir les enfants et les adolescents les plus vulnérables car doublement frappé à la fois par la maladie et par la guerre déclenchée par la Russie contre l'Ukraine. Je tiens enfin à saluer votre initiative autour des conjoints de chefs d'État et de gouvernement. La déclaration finale du premier sommet de Kiev les invitait à se mobiliser pour protéger les femmes, les enfants et les familles dans les situations de conflit. C'était le 23 août 2021, il y a moins d'un an. L'actualité nous a prouvé que cette mobilisation est précieuse. Nous sommes et nous resterons à vos côtés, chère Olena, pour aider les Ukrainiens. Merci à toutes, à tous. Ensemble, nous sommes plus forts. Merci beaucoup. I can speak a bit of French. That, that's all I can do, so I may as well show it off. Um, our next message is the UN Under Secretary General Pramila Patton, who will speak about the horror of war, including sexual and gender-based violence, and support for the victims of such violence. I would like to thank Her Excellency Mrs. Olena Zelenska, the First Lady of Ukraine, for organizing this summit and for the opportunity to address the devastating impact of conflict-related sexual violence. Since February, the United Nations has received over 150 reported allegations of sexual violence committed against women, girls, men and boys. These include harrowing personal testimonies of rape at gunpoint and rape in front of family members as a consequence of the violation of Ukraine's territorial integrity by Russian forces. At the same time, we know that sexual violence is a chronically underreported crime 
and that these data only represent the extreme tip of the iceberg. Sexual violence is one of the most devastating forms of violence committed mainly against women and girls, but also men and boys during armed conflicts. It has lasting harmful effects on victims, their families, communities and societies. It shatters lives and livelihoods with consequences that echo across generations, including in the plight of children born of wartime rape. Wartime sexual violence has enduring effects on survivors that ripple outward to also devastate families, shred the social fabric and undercut community cohesion. It is a crime that destroys relationships as well as personal health and resilience. Secondary traumatic stress is also suffered by family members, especially those forced to witness the assault. History has shown us that unresolved trauma is continued trauma, which only compounds over time when left unaddressed. Indeed, the effects of conflict-related sexual violence linger long after the guns fall silent. Survivors endure nightmares, flashbacks, anxiety and depression, often exacerbated by social ostracism, rejection and shame. In the wake of this crime, which precisely aims to humiliate, dehumanize and terrorize its targets, the physical and psychological trauma is profound. Some victims are infected with sexually transmitted diseases, including HIV. As well as causing physical injury, it is associated with an increased risk of a range of sexual and reproductive health problems, with both immediate and long-term consequences. Ladies and gentlemen, too often the needs of women and girls in conflict settings have been sidelined and treated as an afterthought. We cannot allow this history of silence and inaction to be repeated in the context of Ukraine. The physical and psychological health of survivors, their families and communities hangs in the balance. Its restoration will require sustained political resolve and resources to empower survivors and help them replace horror with healing and hope. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, don't panic, everyone. I'm not going to start playing the piano if that's what you're worried about. So I can see panic mounting on your faces. Somebody much more talented than me will be doing so very shortly. But let's go first to Sima Bahus, who's the Executive Director for UN Women in War Conflicts. Excellency First Lady Zelinska, I salute you for organizing this important event focused on recovery in the face of the ongoing war. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, all protocol observed. Ukrainian women must be at the center of recovery and rebuilding. They must be fully and equally engaged in decision-making at all levels. Their knowledge and perspectives are critical for effective, sustainable, and well-targeted responses. And their skills and economic participation will be vital for implementation. Ukraine has already made significant progress in achieving gender equality. Ratification of the Istanbul Convention is the most recent success. This reinforces both domestic and international dedication to the prevention of violence against women in times of peace as in times of war. UN Women research has revealed increased risks for women and girls of violence at this time. It is vital that the progress achieved so far in preventing violence is safeguarded and further advanced. This is fundamental for the rebuilding we envisage, where women's voices are not absent or silenced, but amplified and influential. As UN Women, we are committed to support you in ensuring that the rights of Ukrainian women and girls are accounted for and responded to. Simple but vital, this inclusion in the recovery and peace-building efforts 
is the true pathway to rebuilding the future together. I thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Well, this is going to be exciting now because uh, I'm going to invite on stage a worldwide musical superstar, a singer actually from my own home country of England. Ellie Golding is here. Ellie, come on up. Ah, two minutes, they're saying. I've got to... OK, so do you want me to knock out a couple of songs? Yeah. I could do one, actually. I won't do one. I actually saw Ellie in the lift earlier, and she was so smartly dressed, I thought it was a first lady. No, no, she's brought her handbag up. Come on, Ellie. I actually, she looked so immaculate this morning, I actually mistook her for a first lady. I just didn't know which country. But anyway, it turned out it was Ellie Golding. Singing superstar. Lovely to see you. And she's going to say a few words for you. Ellie, uh, have you got a microphone? Prepared. I didn't know I was on now, but um, here I am. So I'm going to say um, some words, if that's okay, first, um, just because this is such a, an amazing, huge thing for me to actually be here. Um, is the music? Okay. Um, hi, guys. Uh, Guests of the Summit of the First Ladies and Gentlemen, thank you so much for inviting me here to Kiev today. I had the opportunity to, to walk around Kiev today and I visited an incredible art exhibition. Um, I went to the beautiful St. Michael's Cathedral and I met lots of people. And it's been truly inspirational and uh, emotional. It's an honor to be among you, and my heartfelt thanks goes out to the First Lady of Ukraine, Olena Zelenska, for convening us here, so thank you. Olena, I believe that the courage and fortitude that you and your family have shown will redefine what leadership means for future generations. This horrific war, this brutal and relentless invasion of Ukraine by Russia is almost impossible to put into words. And I stand here conscious that many millions of people are now displaced. And this, this devastating conflict seems to be funded by fossil fuels, like many others. And the international community has to take action so that it doesn't turn into another never-ending conflict. So what more can we do? Everyone on this planet is surely now aware of the bravery and resilience of the Ukrainian people. Hearing the stories and watching the news reports, I struggle to understand how anyone can bear it. I was recently at the UN's Climate and Nature Summit in Stockholm, Sweden, and in my role as a UN environmental ambassador, I met up with youth climate leaders from across the globe. I confess I was surprised to see that the Ukrainian youth climate leader, Ilyas Elkorpti, was there. He had escaped from a war zone, traumatized by his preceding weeks. He nevertheless got on with his work, uh, pushing the world to take up climate action and delink from deadly fossil fuels. It was an unwitting eyewitness of Putin's invasion, and he pushed his own trauma to one side to do that. In the global climate region, Ukrainian scientists, environmentalists, and activists play a fundamental role. Like Ilias, they're still finding ways to contribute, including the contribution of vital science to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So through trauma and turmoil, this nation somehow continues to act on behalf of all humanity. In some small way, by being here today, I want to acknowledge the debt we owe to your bravery and resolve. On taking the night train here, I looked out of the window and I saw endless fields. A reminder that Ukraine is the breadbasket of the world, this bastion of culture, of science and humanity, and is also a cradle of resistance and courage and commitment. And finally, I just want to say, Elena, First Lady of Ukraine, I also wanted to come and stand with you today as a mother. I can't begin to understand the anguish you feel as the childhoods of your children and your nation's children have been ripped away from them. I wanted to look you in the eye and say that the world must act now to make sure their childhoods are recovered and their futures reclaimed. This must be our commitment to you. So thank you for everything you do. Thank you, everyone. So Ellie has another surprise uh, for everyone because she's going to be joined on stage now by a rather famous Ukrainian singer, Dmitro Shurov, known as Piano Boy. Here he is. 
And you're going so, to be performing uh, a duet together, I believe. So today, my new friend, Dimitri, we met today. Um, I wasn't actually going to sing today, but uh, he taught me a very special and important uh, song. And I really, truly hope I can do it justice, but I fear I will not. So if you guys would like to sing with me, maybe a bit, we're going to sing together. Um, but uh, I'm really sorry if it's not very good. But I just learnt it, basically. So maybe you'll sing it with me. Thank you. It's a true story. And Ukrainian knows every word. It's completely true. And every Ukrainian knows every word of this song. Glory to Ukraine. Fabulous performance there from Ellie Golding and Dmitry Shurov. Let's hear it for both of them. And we now have a, another short video, I believe. I don't have a finger.